You're watching Calf Kick Sports. Good afternoon, folks, and thanks for joining us. My name is Tim Wheat with the Calf Kick Sports Podcast, joined as always by Ash. Today we have a special guest. He is the fastest growing, yeah, sorry, he is the youngest and fastest growing ring announcer in the world of combat sports. You may not know the name, but you have seen the face and you have heard the voice. He is done announcing for BYB, XMMA, Airtight, Sparta. Today we have Big Mo, Cody Mormart. Big Mo, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing, sir? Good. Thank you guys so much for having me on. And- Appreciate that awesome introduction as well. Happy New Year. <laughs> what you, an man. intro. What an we're, intro. we're happy to, uh, you know, be part of the future, man. I feel like you're going to be part of, part of the big show one day, man, like as in the UFC. That's uh, that's the goal. You know, I think uh, when I, when I kind of started announcing, I wasn't sure what direction this was all going to take I, I, when it started. And then it started to just absolutely catch fire and really take off. And at this point, you know, whatever organizations I announce for, whoever that may be down the road or whoever it is obviously currently, my goal is to entertain as many fans as possible and just really to to grow combat sports. I, I, I love combat sports, whether it be MMA, whether it be boxing, whether it be kickboxing, whether it be Lutway, whether it be bare knuckle, whatever it may be. And uh, if I can play my role and I can play my part using my voice, using my presenting skills, then so be it. <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely. And what... When you first got into combat sports, what was the first like what was the first event that really got you into this industry? Yeah, so I martial arts is actually my first sport that I ever did. Um, growing up, I had I grew I was growing really quick and I was having trouble kind of understanding my body and how it all worked um, and balance and all that. So my dad got me into into martial arts. I did Shotokan karate uh, for about six seven years. Um, I actually got to train at a pretty prominent dojo. I got to one of my training partners uh, is a guy named Cameron Madani. He's now one of the top uh, karate competitors in the world. Uh, he won at the Pan American Games. I think he was supposed to do the Olympics before all the COVID stuff happened. So I was very in tune with martial arts growing up. Um, and then I transitioned and started playing more team-based sports, uh, football, basketball. I ended up playing football in college. But I was always a huge fan of martial arts, and I was actually always a huge fan of just combat sports in general. So, you know, I grew up watching the UFC. I grew up watching boxing and stuff like that. And then when I got to the time when I actually started working in the industry, what I think helped me is that I was already a fan before I was working in the industry. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So would you say, um, you know, like I I actually had this question already written out, but you kind of almost answered it for me in some ways. So I was going to say, you know, were you ever thinking, I mean, you're a big lad, you're six foot six, you know, you're, you know, you've had an athletic career. Did you ever think I'm going to be a mixed martial artist before going into kind of announcing? No, to be honest. I mean, again, my athletic career from a, from a competition standpoint, when I got done with football, I was kind of just, I was like, kind of done competing in different sports and stuff like that. Obviously I still live an active lifestyle and I might, you know, compete again, again in sports again at some point in my life, but not really. I mean, I don't even think my body could take it to be honest at this point. (laughs) Um, That's why I like to focus on the announcing. And what's cool is I get to take, you know, I still have the competitive edge to me. I still have that sports mindset in me regardless. And so it's cool applying that to something that's a little unique. That's a little out of the box with announcing. I don't think a lot of announcers, kind of attacked it in the same way that I am or as you know aggressively as I am with announcing so that's been fun to apply that that drive and that mindset that probably I learned from sports but I just get to direct it into something new it and and, and directing it into something new it takes a lot of energy to do what you do because you're really trying to hype up the crowd and you're trying to introduce people but is there a particularly memorable crowd that you've worked with in the past that you just go like oh man that that crowd was just on fire that that was my perfect crowd there that's tough. I mean, because every every crowd is obviously different. It's 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 like every crowd is a snowflake, right? There's never ever the exact same crowd. Mm. So I don't necessarily think there's one that specifically stands out in my mind. It's just been it's been cool to just experience doing it for different people with different backgrounds. I mean, for example, um, I was I was fortunate enough uh, to actually announce the first ever uh, Lethway bout uh, in North America and. Um, that was Dave LaDuke's uh, world championship fight against Cyrus Washington. He wanted to fight in America. So we ended up doing the fight in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And what was cool is that we obviously live streamed the show, pay-per-viewed the show, and the whole country of Myanmar tuned in, right? So that's an example of an audience that 
I never once thought that I would be affiliated with or associated with, but because of the nature of the sport, that's who I was able to announce in front of. And that was obviously virtual. So it's just cool having the different audiences that you can work with and just the different backgrounds of people, depending on the fighting. So. And, and Letway in Myanmar is, I don't think people realize it's huge. It's a massive sport there. So to have the entire country watching this, like that's yeah. an honor right there, isn't it? It was incredible. You know, that was such a, it's amazing how that all came together um, because at that point, you know, I was doing Sparta was, was staying through, staying through COVID and was working with the state of Wyoming really well and um, keeping fights going when a lot of promotions weren't. And I think that garnered the attention of Dave LaDuc, who has always wanted to fight in America. And then he also saw that the Wyoming commission was, was very progressive when it came to looking at different sports. Brian Pedersen is the commissioner up in Wyoming. And he said, let's, let's make this happen, you know? And so they, they did the first left way bout featuring a guy named LT Nelson who trains here in Colorado. He's fought damn near every sport you can fight. And that caught Dave's attention. Dave watched it. He's like, hold on a second. They're doing, they're doing left way in North America. Who is this? Opened in. And then next thing you know, they're like, Hey, so I think we're going to do the, the world left way championship fight in Cheyenne. I was like, what? <laughs> and then <laughs> it, and then one thing happened into another. And so now I was able to experience Letway and and be one of the few people that's ever been able to announce it because they don't even really use an announcer in Myanmar traditionally. And I hope I can bring my style over there to Myanmar and maybe announce a fight in uh over there <clears throat> over there in Letway. So it was it's it's cool, man. This <clears throat> is uh, an interesting journey and experience for me. And I'm thankful every day for the opportunity that I have. So that's amazing. Um now, changing gears a little bit, Mo. So we ask this to all fighters. We go, you know, do you ever go through anxiety? And, um, you know, generally, how do you go through, how do you go through or overcome that anxiety before going into a fight? And obviously, and I know you're not fighting, but you are announcing fights. Um, you know, must be some level of pressure there. Do you feel that kind of level of anxiety? And, you know, if so, how do you overcome that? That's a great question. Um, and I've been asked that before. It's, it's different. So basically what I do is, is a, is a form of public speaking. That's if yeah. you really dumb it down. That's basically what it is. And public speaking is actually the number one fear amongst uh, young people. It's actually above heights and burning alive and drowning and people will get scared of it. It's, it freaks people out. And yeah. in my opinion, the reason why people get scared is because they're worried about saying the wrong thing and presenting themselves poorly. It's not necessarily what they're saying. But it's not necessarily the the setting or the environment that they're in. It's just the the anxiety and the fear of of messing up and looking poor when presenting yourself. I don't. I've never really had that issue. I've always grown up pretty comfortable in front of people. I've grown up comfortable on camera, and maybe it's just because I'm more of an extroverted guy. I don't know, but I don't necessarily get nervous. I think what it is is like. Whenever it's a new show, you feel a little bit of butterflies kind of thing. It's a new audience. It's new this. It's different cameras and different. It's all kind of new. But as soon as as soon as I get the first word out, as soon as I really get that first little first little uh, enhanced volume of what I do and kind of get that out of the way, it's kind of like the first hit in a football game, right? You, yeah. you have the butterflies until you get the first hit. And again, that's that ties back to what I was saying when I got on here. You know, it's been cool being able to apply the lessons that I learned from sports into announcing because it's the same kind of concept once you get that first hit once you get that first word you're ready to go so would you it's say a, it's almost yeah. like a switch like you know it, you know you, you go because i had this conversation with uh, another fight joey von blankenberg and he goes look i'm actually nervous man but as soon as i'm in the cage i've gonna there's there's no going back man i'm in the cage i'm there you know let's let's fucking go man is it almost that 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 actually that that I've never heard it presented that way, but I actually, I agree with what you're saying, Ash. That's, that's an interesting point. And I have felt that it's almost like, I mean, just to be candid, it's obviously when I'm in there, I'm representing a promotion. I'm representing a brand. I'm representing, depending on how many fighters are on the card, 15, 20 different fighters. I'm in front of fans that have paid money, both live and virtually. I am representing sponsors. I'm representing so many different entities that have put this promotion together so, yeah, there is a little bit of, you know, I'm the guy with the microphone. I got to kind of control the pulse of the event. And that's really that's really the importance of an announcer. People don't understand this. The announcer is the individual that actually carries the tone of the event throughout the event. I've had this conversation before, but people don't understand that the announcer is the most consistent person during yeah. a show. Refs swap out. 
Fighters only do their fight. Commentators, while they're <laughs> on camera occasionally, they're most of the time off camera, and they're usually just reacting to what's going on. Now everyone plays their own role. The point is, is that with an announcer, it's the same announcer for the whole show. Maybe they do a different person for the undercard. That happens too. They announce the same way. They stand in the same place. They kind of carry it through and they control the pulse of the show. They carry the emotions of the show and how they want to say things and how they want to enunciate things and how they want to hype something up or, or play something down. It's all controlled. And so, yeah, Ash, to answer your question, I, I have gotten in there and felt, all right, this is my this is my stage, I guess, for lack of a better word. This is my microphone. I got to make it happen to make sure this show goes on. And awesome. it's not just nervousness. It's also energy. Some of the shows that you have done have been four, six hours long, and you're on the entire time. People are looking yeah. at you the entire time. How do you maintain energy for that amount of time? I've actually never been asked that question. That's a great oh. question. It actually is. It's it's tricky. And so because let's say a show starts, I'd say the average, average card usually starts at about 7 o'clock. So mm -hmm. 7 o'clock. I'd say they run for an average of about four hours, about 11 o'clock. Again, I'm just picking standard times. I usually will get to the venue around four or five o'clock. So to do sound checks, to go through, you know, quick run throughs to make sure that everything is blocked out with production and stuff like that. So again, like you said, I'm there for, you know, basically seven hours. And the energy piece is crucial because the energy is a big part of what I do. I consider myself one of the more energetic announcers that are out there. It's something that I take pride in. Announcers have different styles. They have different ways that they do things. I like to be energetic. I like to have, you know, a lot of passion and energy into what I do. So I have to understand that I have to let that out at certain points. It's, it's, it's tough to keep that type of energy for seven hours. Luckily, I don't have to. I only have to keep that level of energy for when I'm announcing. So it's about balancing the energy. It's about kind of prepping and planning everything. It's about, you know, resting where I can, keeping the voice warm where I can. I'm pounding cough drops during the show. I, I'm superstitious. I like to take two shots of vodka before the show to kind of start <laughs> now, uh, you know, and take an energy drink and things like that. I'm superstitious. And so I do those things to kind of just get my, get my mind right, kind of wipe everything clear, relax, all that kind of stuff. So two uh, shots of vodka. Ash, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else apart from the vodka? Just the two shots of vodka. Just the two shots of vodka. <laughs> nice. How, yeah. how do you, so obviously, you know, you go through, you know, six hours of high energy, high performance and how do you kind of unwind from that? Because it must be hard just to, yeah. to get a good well, a good night's sleep after that, surely. Yeah. I mean, I would struggle with it, personally. You guys are asking great questions. I've never been asked these before. Um, <laughs> no, that's, that's a really, that's an interesting part that I've had to figure out is, like, when the show ends, I'm still ready to go. Like, I'm yeah. like, it's like getting out of a concert. Like, when a concert ends, you still are, like, you're still tapping your foot a little bit. You're still moving and growing, yeah. things like that. So I'm still energetic. Um, but I like, you know, obviously I got to wind down at that point and whatever I do after I do, I, I do after, but I like to, I like to kind of just sit back and, but at the same time, I'm my biggest critic. And so usually when I finish a show, if it was streamed or something like that, uh, I immediately go back and watch it. Um, because I just, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist with what I do. I want to see how I did. I want to see how I sounded. Um, so I'm, sometimes I just immediately go back to, my hotel room or whatever and i immediately just go back and if it's available i, I watch watch film type of thing man you know, we've done that man it's absolutely true that you are your biggest critic because we've yeah. gone back and listened to when we started doing the kafka sports show we went back to our first episode and we deleted it and just like <laughs> <laughs> it, it is unbelievable to go back good, i'm like what the hell is this like I'll, I'll <laughs> <laughs> but it is hard you know what? I think another thing that people don't realize in kind of an entertainment or front facing in front of people listening to yourself is a pain in the ass. It yep. sucks listening to yourself. How like how do you do it? How did you get over it? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I was, <laughs> Just I forced what, it. <laughs> I, I think what it is is like you have to understand. Let's talk about people that work in some form of entertainment or content or media or whatever. Like we could yes. take. You two as an example, you take my, myself as an example, an actor or whatever. You have to understand that you are the product. You are ultimately your personality, how you present yourself. That is what is the product. That is what people are viewing. That's what people are potentially buying. That's what they're watching, all that kind of stuff. 
So it, it's not necessarily that you have to sit there and like, oh my God, I hate the way my voice sound. You have to you have to analyze it from a from a product standpoint. Is this product good? Did I present this product well? Take yourself out of it. It's not a personal thing anymore. When I'm watching myself, I'm not sitting there going, oh, this is me. I'm saying, no, this is the ring announcer, Big Mo, announcing this fight. How did it sound? And I look back and I go, okay, I could I could change that phrasing a little bit differently. I, I paused a little bit too long there. Um, the, I, I'm, my, my posture is a little off here. Like I'm hypercritical. And it's strictly from the standpoint of is that, if again, if I am a product, if I'm being represented, if I'm being paid, if I'm working for a promotion, I need to do the best that I can. So it's it's really removing yourself and just examining the work and the job that you're doing. I hope, maybe that makes sense. No, that 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 hundred percent makes sense. And I think as an individual, when you're looking at yourself and you're trying to analyze your own voice, and it's hard because sometimes you're looking at yourself with almost like ro- rosy tinted glasses. You know, you're like, it's actually a lot better. You know, this is actually not bad. And then you 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 give it to someone else, and they're like, ah, you know, you probably should do this better. Or, you should yep. change it. Do you have your own team or, you know, kind of someone independent from yourself to, to almost give you advice? So, damn, good questions. That's <laughs> These are really good questions. Um, so here's how I look at it. The first layer of critic, basically, that I look at is the fans. In the arena, that is the easiest way to gauge how it's going. Okay? Yeah. I'm very interactive with the fans. Uh, that's something that I take a lot of pride in. If you ever, if you were ever to go to my show, and hopefully I can have you guys at a show sometime, you're going to see, like, I'm always talking to the fans. Like, in between fights, in between breaks, intermissions, I go out in the crowd and I mingle and talk and I take pictures and I love, like, interacting with the fans and, and they all enjoy it. So that helps me get a pulse of how the show is going, how they're reacting both vocally Uh, If they cheer back, if they, you know, kind of do call and react with me and that kind of stuff, I know it's going well. I know I've got a good finger on the pulse of the audience. Obviously, if they're interacting with me, things like that. Okay, that's so that's going good. Then the next kind of layer of critic is, you know, the promotion that I'm working with. How's the production staff feel about it all? Is everything sounding okay? I'm always talking to them like, hey, does this sound okay? Does this sound good? Do I need to turn this up? I'm always in communication with them. So that's kind of the second layer. Then... After the show is over, to your question, Ash, yeah, I have friends that watch my work. I'm, I'm obviously very grateful to have a, a decently sized social media following that obviously is my critic of work. Um, and so those are those are the kind of things that I'm looking for. And with constructive criticism, whether it's just normal criticism or constructive, I take it all in um, and I kind of just see how I can take whatever was given to me and see how I can maybe smooth it over or improve it all. Um, you know, I have friends on the on the business and marketing side that help me that, you know, guide me in some good directions on how to do things on social media. So it's all about networking. It's all about getting people around you whose opinions you value. Um, yeah. The number one opinion that I value is that of the of that of the fan. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you get such quick feedback from the fans as well. You can't just like take a second and like, oh, that was bad. You, you just got to like keep going. You got to keep that energy yeah. going. Right. Yeah. And one thing that constantly sticks out, you're an amazing announcer. You are an incredibly good announcer. I'm not just saying that because you're on the show. If someone else asked me and I had never met you, I'd be like, man, Big Mo is killing it out there. Yeah. But in an hour from now, we got Cody Gibson coming on and you, oh, yeah. he was on. You know the boy. Yeah. He main evented on yeah. XMMA3. We were doing um, some research for our boy here, and one of the comments on Reddit said, this announcer looks like a bad guy in an 80s high school movie. <laughs> so in honor of you coming on the show, Big Mo, we got dressed up. Man, if we had Jimmy Lennon Jr. coming on, i just wear some old t-shirt out of the trash. Okay? <laughs> but we got Big Mo coming on the show. So hashtag sunglasses inside. Oh, oh. I actually need to find my sunglasses. One second. Miss. This is this is this is oh there it is world famous there we go boys that my, that my girlfriends so I love it well the, the, the nicknames man it's that's the funniest thing for me to read because look I, the sunglasses have been such a it's it's the first thing that people notice and it's it's funny watching it all happen because the sunglasses are just it's just part of you know my style that's all it is it's not nothing more, nothing less. It's just something that I, as to how I approach my wardrobe, you know, Bruce Buffer likes to wear silk jacquard blazers, you know, uh, some, um, some announcers wear other things. I like to just, I wear sunglasses with mine. And so, but it's funny because that's, 
it sets off various nicknames. I've gotten Johnny Bravo. I've gotten Duke Nukem. I've gotten Johnny Cage. I've gotten <laughs> bad guy from an 80s movie, whatever it may be. And I think it's fun. And the whole goal yeah. of it is if it gets someone's attention, then that's all that really matters. And if it makes them focus in on what's going on because they're they're visually attracted to one thing, so be it. And then usually it's once they hear me announce, they don't talk about the sunglasses anymore. They only talk about the sunglasses before they hear me announce. Once they hear, hear me announce, they just go, oh, he's an announcer that happens to wear sunglasses. And it's going to happen regardless. But yeah, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so it. I about 10, 10, 12 years ago, I worked in a tailor shop. So I know how much it takes to go in and, and make, get a custom suit made. Yep. A gentleman of your size, a gentleman of your stature, how are you keeping such a f good wardrobe here? Like, man, this is, you've got some great suits, but suits are not cheap, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually in the process of looking for a suit sponsor. Uh, talked to a couple brands that I think would, uh, would work well with me. And uh, uh, I think could help. I think I could help kind of style and show off what they make. But no, uh, suits for me is, is very difficult. So I'm big into fashion. Um, I take a lot of pride in fashion and how I present myself and how I look. Um, and I am tough to size. Luckily, I've got a great tailor here in Denver that I work with on one-off pieces. Um, so it's more so I find a suit that I like and he kind of helps customize it and things like that. I don't, I don't do any bespoke stuff yet. Um, I just do the custom tailoring. But no, it's hard because... I'll never fit anything off the rack. Um, basically, for, for those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm, this is the fashion nerd coming out of me. Men's clothing, when they're cut off the rack, they're cut very boxy. Very little men's clothing is tapered. It's starting to become more and more tapered, but with suits still, even if they call it slim fit, even if they call it tapered fit, it's really not. It's a very boxy look. And for someone like myself, I my jacket size, I wear a 46 extra long. And because I have pretty wide shoulders, it's a but big man. Waist, I have a, I wear like a 34 inch waist. So the thing is, is that regardless of what I buy, it needs to get tailored. There's, I, if I wore some off the rack, I would look like absolute garbage, which I refuse to do. <laughs> I refuse to ever look poor, like or not poor, but look poorly presented. I want to look as good as possible. And so, yeah, working with a suit tailor is is great, and and good. Th it's a good thing I love wearing clothes, you know. So it's a good thing that. Uh, Luckily, my brand and how I present myself, it also crosses into what I like to just wear in, in general. So nice. Yeah, absolutely. So changing changing gears a little bit more. I know you said, you know, I'll never go into fighting and stuff, but say for example, just just hypothetical here. I'm gonna throw a hypothetical. Three or four years from now, you know, you're like you're like the biggest, biggest announcer in the world, you know. Um, <laughs> you're the biggest, you're the best, yeah. And at this point, yeah, you know, the opportunities are flooding in and uh, it's YouTube boxing. <laughs> Come on. You're telling me you wouldn't do that for a couple of million. Oh, I would do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> who I would mean, you fight? Say what? Who, who would you fight? I mean, whatever YouTube star at that point is trying to ruffle feathers in the fighting industry, <laughs> I'll go ahead and step in there. But no, I mean, look, I, again, it's, would I be open to doing it? A hundred percent. I think it's awesome. And I would love to train it. You know, when I have some more time, I, I, I would love to actually, one of the things that I want to do is, and, and, and this is good being the age that I am and being as deeply invested into the sport as I am, I would love to put myself through a fight camp. I would love to experience that because as I do a lot of media work in the industry and as I, and regardless of where my career takes me, if I do announcing, if I do commentary, if I do a TV show about combat sports, I have no idea. I would love to be able to connect with the fighters a little bit deeper. And I think the best way to do that would be experience what they've done. And so I would love to put myself through a fight camp. I think that'd be cool if the opportunity was ever there. Oh, and I think there's some great gyms around Colorado where you can find the opportunity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the gyms in Colorado are insane. It's probably, in my opinion, it's probably the best state for for training next martial arts. I mean, you got, I mean, 10, 12 championship level gyms in Colorado alone. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, Colorado is notoriously tough state. And Colorado over the last year has had a little bit of suffering with forest fires and other such things. How has the recovery in your home state been? Well, that was not only my home state. That was my hometown. Hometown, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. And so I actually had to uh, help my father evacuate. Um, I lost about a thousand homes in our hometown. 
Um, a lot of my friends actually lost homes. They're doing relief stuff right now. It was just freakish. You know, it's fires like that don't usually happen and they don't cross into residential neighborhoods that quickly. But when you have hundred mile an hour winds that can carry an ember as far as it wants to go, then that's what happens. And, uh, luckily I think that the town of superior and the town of Louisville, uh, acted quickly, which was good. Um, they got everyone out. As far as I know, there were no reported deaths, which when a thousand homes burned down, the fact that no one died is, is huge. So very thankful there. Um, I'm thankful that my family and friends are okay. Uh, so yeah, and now just the, the rebuilding happens. But no, Colorado is a tough state. And uh, Colorado has gone through some some weird stuff. But Colorado has always been one of those states that I just, I don't know, it's, that there's certain states in the country that just kind of always hold it down and kind of always do their own thing. And, and Colorado has been one of them. And uh, I, I'm happy to be from here for sure. Um, and just, you know, just for anyone watching, is there anywhere, is there any kind of, you know, charities or organizations that are helping that rebuild uh, that yeah. they can donate to that you'd know of? So I know a lot of individual families are doing their own uh, kind of GoFundMes or fund or funding efforts. Um, I know that there's various uh, government ran charitable organizations that you can donate to. I believe you can navigate a lot of those uh, from the town of Superior website town of Lewis or city of Louisville website. I'm sure the state of Colorado website can link there as well. So there's a yeah. variety of places to go. I could list out 40, 50 websites. So you just kind of got to go on and find and find one that fits with whatever you're looking to do or donate. So. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, so, you know, we, we do ask this to everyone. Um, and I think it's really interesting because, you know, you're, you're, you're very young still, you know, still young in this game even though yep. you've done it for a while as well. But where do you see yourself in five years' time, Mo? Um, from the announcing side, um, truthfully, my level of confidence, I believe I can be the biggest announcer in the world, um, and I believe that I will be. I think that, you know, what, when it comes down to it, when, when someone says something like that, it, it typically speaking, that's a very strong statement to make. And I'm not saying it from a place of, arrogance. I'm saying it from a place of confidence. I know how hard I'm working at this. I know that my input is going to lead to output. And I know that I'm putting a lot more into this than a lot of announcers are. Um, I'm just attacking it very differently. I'm getting a lot of work really quickly. I'm networking like a mother. I mean, it's, it's, and so the thing is, is I think that if, if I can stay on the trajectory that I'm on, um, which again, I've only been announcing now for two years, if I can stay on this same trajectory, yeah, I do think I 100% can be the biggest announcer in the world. Um, and beyond announcing, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to enter into other forms of entertainment work. Um, I actually just finished uh, shooting a TV show uh, for Hulu uh, that I can't divulge what it is yet, but it's going to be incredible when I'm allowed to. And you guys may be the first ones to know. Uh, oh, congratulations, and, though. Uh, uh, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so once I'm allowed to kind of talk about that, I'll talk about that. So that was cool. So maybe some more acting work, some TV work, stuff like that. So I don't know. Um, but ultimately what I do know is that my work ethic and how I attack things, I think that I'm going to put myself in a position to, to succeed. And so wherever it takes me, it takes me. Um, but as of now, the goal is to be the biggest announcer in the world. And when I say the biggest, I, I, I don't mean that from a personal standpoint. I mean, whatever organization or whatever shows are the biggest at that time period, I want to be doing it. Absolutely. You're going to be on top. And one, th one thing that really sticks out to me with you, Big Mo, is that you really know how to use social media effectively. Yes. Every app I go on, I was going on websites and I was like, man, there's Big Mo interview. And then I was going on TikTok and I was like, man, he's in the top of TikTok here. He's, he's all over Instagram. Like, so using social media effectively, especially over the pandemic, like what is your advice to other people? Because all of us work in a social media space. What advice? You've learned a lot and you do it very effectively. What advice would you give to others? It's everything. It is yeah. everything. People don't understand that in today's time, your ability to reach people is greater than any point in human history by a million fold. You can put something out and it can be seen by someone on the other side of the planet within a few seconds, right? It's a very, very new thing. And it's, it's getting even bigger and bigger and bigger. So the thing is, though, is that if you don't put yourself out there, no one can do it. 
So people talk about and people ask, well, why are you so active on social media? It's because I'm always putting things out there. I'm always putting content out there. I'm always engaging with people. I'm active in the community. If you go to some of the, the big pages on Instagram, if you go to, you know, various MMA or boxing pages or, you know, even different promotions that start conversations, I'm in there commenting. I go online. I'm in the community, all that kind of stuff. The only way to be seen in the world of social media is to allow yourself to be seen. If you don't put yourself out there, they're not going to know who you are. So it's about being active. It's about going out there. It's about getting out of that comfort zone and, and putting yourself out there. And, and that's the thing that a lot of people don't like is a lot of people don't like that social media can make you vulnerable, which it does. You allow yourself to be criticized. You allow yourself to be, uh, to be uh, someone to say things about you that you may not like. And it happens to me, like, believe me, there's, there's videos about me out there that a lot of people go and comment and, and they hate and they throw shade and that's fine. I'm not, I, you're not going to be a fan of me and I hope I can change your mind, but Clearly, you don't get it, and that's okay, and I'm going to keep working to hopefully turn you into a fan. But the thing is, is that you can't be afraid of people saying that. You cannot yeah. be afraid of people saying those things. You have to put yourself out there. That's the only way to be seen. Uh, you know, I, I love that, what you just said, because it reminded me of a quote, yeah, that Juniana Pena put in a story, and um, it's a bit of a tangent, but I'm going to just mention anyway. She mm -hmm. said, if you're not ready to be hated on, then you're not ready for success. And I think that's a brilliant line, you know. I agree. Anyone who's kind of just gone through a bit of hate um if you can't handle that then how are you going to handle the success with exactly. your roots? that's a that's a great quote that, that you can use that quote in the same in the same breath that you use mine right if you want to be if you want to be great in whatever you do if you want to build a brand if you want to be seen if you want to have an influence in whatever field that you're working on you have to understand that to do that you're going to be put forth in front of a lot of people you're going to be put in front of the market you can't be afraid of what they're going to say. You can't back that back down from it. I remember. So the sunglasses are a perfect example, right? This is something that I, it's just, it's the number one piece of ridicule. Like people, I think, enjoy my announcing. I think people enjoy my style of announcing. I think people like my energy, but for some reason, the sunglasses just people, some people just can't stand it. So I got to take the food out of it. The thing is, 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 what people don't get, and, and this is the, is that I, I do it to just get my name out there. I do it to be seen. I do it to be noticed. It's just part of what I do. It's not necessarily a place of disrespect or anything like that. But you have to understand that when I put when I put myself out there, I'm opening myself to that kind of that kind of ridicule. So, it, and it and it's tough. And it's tough. So I want you to to reverse it now. Okay. So you've taken a lot of criticism in your career. I'm going to give you the opportunity to go trash talk some other people. All right. <laughs> We got a Michael Buffer, Bruce Buffer, Jimmy Lennon Jr., a Lenny Hart. I mean, we love all of them. Mm -hmm. Which, who was kind of your inspiration, actually? We're not going to criticize them. We're, we're all adults here. We know. We're not going to criticize any of these people because they're perfect at what they do. But they all have such unique styles. Who was kind of your, like, uh, muse when you were coming up? So, that's a good question. Um, I like to take inspiration from a lot of different announcers. I like to see what's working and what's not. And more importantly, I like to see where there's an opportunity. A lot of announcers, and this is no discredit to them, but a lot of announcers, they're, they're kind of all the same thing. They do all the same thing. They say the same things. They, their catchphrases are one word different from one another. They all act the same. They dress the same. They speak the same, which is fine. And, and credit to them. They, they, they have a job. They have employment. They're doing their thing. I like to look at things that people do differently. I like to see where there's places where an announcer has stood out for how they've announced and, and done well before. And the other side of it too, is that I think if you're chasing something and I want to be the best at it, I take inspiration from the best. And in my opinion, the two best are the buffers um, in their own right. Um, I think they both do things that are unique. i also think that they both do things that are good for their respective sport. I don't think Michael Buffer's style would work in the UFC. And when I say work, I mean be better than Bruce's and vice versa. I don't think Bruce's style would be better than Michael's style in the world of boxing. They're very different. And so the thing is, is as I'm announcing, I want to take inspiration from both. I wanted to see how I could pull some from each one, you know, get an idea from it all. Obviously I'm not trying to copy them. I want to be my own. I want to be my own style. Like a lot of people have, have called me the next Bruce Buffer and all that. And that's a world of a compliment. Like Bruce is, Bruce is an icon to me. He's an idol. 
I love Bruce dearly. I still have the opportunity to meet him. I hope I can one day, but I don't want to be Bruce. I don't want to be Michael. I don't want to be Jimmy Lennon Jr. I don't want to be any of those people. I want to be me. I want to do my own thing. Now, if I can take inspiration from them and maybe twist it and turn it into my own style, then that's what I'm going to do. But I just want to be myself. I want to be my own announcer. I want to be, be my own brand. And I just want to be the best version of Big Mo that I can be. And I saw I saw that you there was one uh, video that you put out. And uh, I was like, I could see that there was a little bit of influence from Lenny Hart. Obviously, you're, you're your own individual. You know, you're, you've got your own style. Uh, but it was the always roll the R's. For Kevin, Kevin Fernandez, I was like, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Not many people can do that. How long did it take to learn how to roll those R's? Yeah, I, it's, I've always just kind of been able to do it. I, I don't know. I, for some reason, my, my pronunciation uh, with Spanish names, Portuguese names, has always actually been pretty good. I've actually always pronounced and enunciated the language very well. I can speak a very little bit of Spanish. I actually learned a lot of conversational Spanish from my first job. I worked in a Mexican restaurant, and so I actually was taught a little bit by the kitchen staff and stuff like right. that. So I've always been comfortable with those languages, and pronunciation is a huge, huge thing for me. I'll get to that in a second. So rolling the R's is something that I just, I don't know, it always got people excited. They always liked it. it again, it's, it's listening to the crowd. I remember I yeah. did it before. I first time I did it for a crowd, it kind of got them going a little bit, and I was like, that's i was like take that note that one that was good it's like a comedian right like that was a good joke i like how i did that one right so then i just started applying it to all of them and i also i roll the r's when i'm not even really supposed to and in the dialect you roll the r's when it's a double r i do it even if it's not it's <laughs> but it's my style it like, is to me right and yeah. so it, but that's the whole thing but with enunciation and pronunciation in general that is something that i take a world of pride in this is something that I think so many announcers, I think just they they cut corners with this. A guy's name or a woman's name or a fighter's name is is should be pronounced how it's meant to be pronounced. So yeah. I go to the fighters. I, I go to the weigh-ins. I go to – I try to avoid going to the locker room before the show, but if I have to, I have to. And I just say, look, how do you pronounce your name? Oh, well, you can just say it like this. No. How do you pronounce your name? I will pronounce your name how you want it pronounced. And then they'll tell me. And then what yeah. I'll do, my cheat code, and an announcer might steal this, go ahead. What I do is I, I, I write the name how it sounds so I don't get confused when I'm up there. And this is very big mm -hmm. for Portuguese names because they're not written how they're always pronounced. This is big for uh, some uh, uh, Eastern European names as well. So I like – I don't – use the cards too much i more so use my cards as a reference i actually i like to look at the camera i like to look at the fighter i just use i sometimes just glance at my card if i have to but for a, a tricky name i write it out how it sounds so i can basically just read it opposed to trying to remember okay is it do i pronounce the ch do i pronounce the j what about the ou i i've already gotten past that point so i'm very big on pronunciation that's something that I take a lot of pride in, which I wish a, a lot of announcers did. I think a lot of announcers butcher some names. And just it, yeah, it, that, that in my opinion is disrespectful to the fighter. If you can't even say his name right, I mean, shoot. <laughs> or <hurt him. laughs> remember, yeah, that just Go reminds ahead. me of when people used to pronounce uh, Francis. Joe used to do this as well. Joe Rogan, believe mm -hmm. it or not, like yeah, Francis uh, Gano, and it's like what the hell? <laughs> I, I I I just I. Again, it's no disrespect to whoever works in the industry. They do, they do their job how they do their job. It's like, I don't know how, like, my thing is, is like, when I see Josh Smith, I know how to pronounce that name. Yeah. You, you can, you can see a name that comes up on the card and you go, oh, that's an interesting name. How do I pronounce it? Now, usually my, I've done this enough now and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with names to where I know I probably can get it 99% of the time. But it takes two seconds to go to the fighter and ask, how do you say this? They know how to say their name. They'll answer to you pretty damn quickly. So, I don't know. It, it's just a little bit of extra effort. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I've screwed up a fighter's name once in an interview. And this was it, was, it was Kayla Harrison's opponent. And I was interviewing Kayla. And she corrected me on her own opponent's name. And from then on, I went, just go listen to someone. It takes 10 seconds even to go on YouTube and listen to someone else say this person's name so I don't F up in front of Kayla Harrison. You know yeah, what I mean? And if you don't know too, Google has 
audio playback. You can type it in in a translate and there's various sites. And at least at least you have a chance of that being right. At least you're at least you're doing a little bit of research to know it. I don't know. I just I, I think it's, a, it's an extra step just to really show some some true commitment to the craft and the job. So completely agree with you. A person's name is their core. Now, speaking of. We ask this to everybody who comes on their sh on our show. In the MMA industry, there's tons of signature brands, whiskeys, hot sauces, tequilas. If there was a Big Mo signature brand, what would your signature brand be? That's a great question. Um, damn. I mean, I would love a, I mean, a clothing line would, would make a lot of sense. Sunglass line would obviously make a lot of sense. A vodka line would make a lot of sense. Uh, a fragrance might make a lot of sense. Things that kind of fit with my brand. Um, I said, I don't know. I've never actually thought about that. <laughs> about, uh, you know what? I don't want to share this on the wavelengths, but I've thought about maybe a cough drop line because I'm big on cough drops. While I announced they're actually a secret to my success, um, to keep, to keep everything lubricated in there and stuff like that. So I don't know. I've never actually given that that much thought, but I kind of, I like where your head's at. I might need to think about that a little bit. Well, get back to us when you when you figure it out. We'll we'll plug it, man. We're ready for you. We're here for you. We got your back. You're our boy now. Guys, I like you guys' style. <laughs> so I, I'm just gonna do a quick lead out, and then Big Mo, you're gonna get the last word. We are Calf Kick Sports. My name's Tim Wheaton. He is Ash. We can find me at Tim Wheaton MMA on Instagram and Twitter. He is Ash MMA.CKS. Links will be down below. And for our guests, thank you so much for coming on the show. You can find them on Twitter, Big Mo Official, or Instagram, Big Mo. And for your all of your social medias, I'm going to put the links down below for our listeners. But Big Mo, you get the last word. Tell the people where they can find more of you, what you got going on. Give them everything here. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, you guys have been supporting me for a while now, and I sincerely do appreciate it. Um, I've been lucky enough to my, my journey in this sport has been so cool, um, and it's because of the people within the community. I think the combat sports community, while interesting and while unique is is overall fairly supportive you know i think that i rattle i ruffled some feathers when i got started in this because i was new on the scene i was this young kid that was you know whatever had people had people to say about me um but i've been really able to carve out a niche for myself and i've really been able to build a career for myself that has allowed me to announce in front of you know cumulatively now well, millions of people right i've been able to do do my job in front of a lot of different people and my whole goal is to be the best version of what I can do. And my whole goal is to be the best announcer that I can be. So that's why I'm so active on social media is because my goal here is to entertain the fans. That's my number one goal. Announcers have different goals when they announce. They have different things that they're focusing on. The biggest one for me is entertaining the people and the consumers of the product, which is the community. And beyond that, I want to help grow combat sports to be the biggest sport in the world. I believe it's the best sport in the world. And I mean that when I say sport, I mean cumulatively, whether it be MMA, whether it be boxing, all that kind of stuff. I want to get that to be the biggest sport in the world. And I think that my youth and my the market that I can play to, I think, can help. I want to grow to be as big as possible. Look, I'm, I'm in my 20s, man. I, I, want, I want there to be fight nights at colleges, right? I want people tailgating fights. I want fighting to be the sport in the world because the energy of a fight is different than anything has and anything anyone has ever imagined. It's not the same. Take it from someone that played football. I love football. I love basketball. I've been to more games than you can count. The energy is great, but it ain't a fight. It's so different, man. It's so different. You got 22 guys on the field. That's awesome. You got two guys in a ring. Very different. So my goal is to be the best announcer that I can, to do the best job that I can, to entertain as many people as I can. So I'm going to be active in the community. I want people talking to me. I want people letting me know what they think. This is, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm because of my youth and because of the fact of, of where I'm placed in the market, I have the opportunity to, to grow and to adapt and to be built into something that can, that can really harness the energy of the fight community. So I've been lucky enough to have people that follow me and people that appreciate my work. And for that, I'm so grateful. I am the people that follow me and support me have been wonderful and if you don't follow me and support me i'm going to keep working to do the best job that i can make sure you follow me on social media i'm most active on instagram at official.bigmo i'm also there on twitter i'm growing my presence on tiktok check out check out my tiktok at official.bigmo you guys are going to be seeing a lot more of me and uh, i got some amazing things planned for 2022 some things that i can share some things that i can't got some big news hopefully coming down the wire here soon 
you guys are going to see me everywhere. I'm going to keep attacking this industry. I'm going to keep doing what I can to make you all fans to grow the sport. And in the meantime, let's get wild. <laughs> we can't wait now, man. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, fellas.